Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Aren't you glad to be here at RCC? Awesome seeing you. Awesome being with you. Hey, before we forget, let's welcome all those who are joining us online this morning. We are honored to have you. Welcome them all this morning. It is great to be with you wherever you may be. Hey, I want to say this to those online and those of us who are in the room, and that is starting in two weeks, the very first Sunday of February, we're all going to come down together in one platform online. So we're no longer going to be on Facebook and YouTube. Everything is going to come together at riverchristian.church slash online. We're going to get the best quality. We're going to be able to interact if we choose to there. And so if you happen to be out of town, you can still plug into us, all those online. Make sure you go ahead and start shifting over as soon as you can next week and make it a lot easier for you in February. So once again, go to riverchristian.church slash online. We will all be at one location. We have tons of people watch us and we'll all be able to be at one spot. So I'm looking forward to that. On top of that, we are right now in our daily Bible reading and I hope it's been a blessing to you. Um, just a couple of days ago, I was, uh, I was walking around the house. I heard something outside. I walk outside. My daughter is outside reading her Bible. Right now, diving into the daily Bible reading, she's going to River Christian church dot church slash daily bible and that's where she gets her schedule from and i tell you what it's kind of cool when your daughter is reading through the word of god and uh, I hope I hope you're enjoying that because our scriptures and our sermons and everything are coming out of this reading for the most part of the year except for the month of February. And I'll explain that later on. But right now, I just want to say something to you if you don't know RCC. And here it is. We are a Bible church. Amen. And I would say this. Don't take Nathan's word from it for it or somebody else's word or even culture's word. We base, on, we base our beliefs and our life on the word of God. And so I just want you to know that that's why we're doing this series to kind of say, you know what, it's time for us, if there's any time, whether you're in California or right here on campus right now, we all can read the Bible and be on the same page together. And so this past week, we've been studying about a guy in our daily Bible reading, his name is Joseph. And Joseph picks up in Genesis chapter 37, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 37. And Joseph takes up quite a bit of real estate, starting in 37, chapter 37 all the way to the end of Genesis. Genesis is really easy to find. It's the very first book in the Bible. Now, the interesting thing about Joseph, I think about Joseph because his life started off with a dream. And, you know, if you would have told me at age 19, Nathan, in 25 years from now, you're going to be serving and ministering in Florida. I'd be like, sweet. Now, that's awesome. That means I graduated from college. Who would have thought that, you know? And then, hey, you're going to be married to a wonderful, beautiful woman. I'd be like, can't wait to meet her. And how about, you're going to have three of the coolest kids on the planet. Oh, that's incredible. You're going to be serving in a church that you love and you adore. I would be like, I can't wait to live the life I'm about to live. This is so wonderful. But then they say, I'm not going to tell you what happens between age 19 and age 44. And I've probably been like, I probably don't want to know. And that's kind of the story of Joseph. His life starts off with these dreams And in the conception of the dreams, all the way to fulfillment of the dreams, there's a lot of stuff in between. And so we start diving into his life right here in Genesis chapter 37. Here's what it says. This is the account of Jacob's family line. We talked about Jacob last week. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his, look at this, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, he's tattletaling on his brothers, but I want you to notice something. Right out of the gate, we notice that Joseph does not grow up in what's called a traditional family structure. The, the statement right there, father's wives, is a dead giveaway, don't you think? I mean, his dad is married to two sisters, Leah and Rachel. We talked about them last week. Neither of them can get pregnant. And so what they do is they give their servant girls to to Jacob. And it's kind of be surrogate moms through them. And and I just want to say, two wives, bad idea. Two sister wives, really bad idea. Two sister wives that are infertile, priceless, right? I mean, you you get a whole section of the Bible is what you get. Four wives, 12 children later, and what we have is we have favoritism. Joseph is a favorite son out of the favorite wife, and everyone knew it. Everyone knew it in the family. When the older, older boys would walk in the room, Joseph would kind of ask them, hey, how's, your, how's the chores doing? But when Joseph walked in the room, when Jacob saw Joseph walk in the room, man, his, his eyes would light up. 
and, and he would just brag about Joseph. Jacob knew how Joseph was doing in school. He knew his teachers. He knew how his day was going. He was a little more fuzzy about the details of the other boys. In ways that most parents are not aware of, but kids can smell a mile away, Jacob's favoritism kind of leaped out of him towards Joseph. And then one day, Jacob's favoritism of Joseph took a concrete form when Jacob gave Joseph a, a robe. Some translations will say it was a richly ornated robe. The old King James Version said it was a coat of many colors. Maybe you grew up hearing that. What makes this gift unique is the quality and the distinctiveness of the gift. Let me put it this way. Jacob bought Joseph's coat at Nordstrom's, okay? It was hand-tailored. He got the other boy's coat at the clearance section in Walmart. You see what I'm saying? You can see the difference. You think there's going to be a problem? Absolutely. There's problems coming. Look what happens. When his brothers saw that their father loved him, what? Loved him more than any of them, they what? They hated him and could not speak a kind word to Joseph. Maybe you grew up in a home like that. Maybe you grew up in a home that was critical of you. Maybe you grew up in a home that was constantly negative. And homes like that have a way of crushing your dreams, don't they? But in all honesty, I have to say this. Joseph doesn't help much. I mean, one day he had a dream about being exalted and being esteemed more than he already was. And you might think that Joseph would have had enough sense to keep quiet about this. You would think that he would notice that his brothers were dying on the inside. No, instead, he gathers his brothers around together with his nice robe on. And he says, hey, I want to tell you about a dream I had about me. And they're like, oh, we would just love to hear about your self-exalting dreams, you total goober. I mean, yeah, that'd be f phenomenal. We'd love to hear about that. And then he says this, hey, I had this dream, and, you know, I had, uh, all the sheaves were out in the field, and my sheaf was bigger, and your sheaves were all smaller, and they bowed down to my sheaf. I kind of think I might be, you know, ruling over you guys. You guys might be serving me. He talks about another dream. I had a dream that all the stars in the sky, even the sun and the moon, bow down to me. I'm just kind of brainstorming here, guys, but I might be the center of the universe. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And look at this. They what? They hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. In this family, there's a total breakdown of community. One day, his brothers are out in the flock, and his father Jacob sends Joseph out to check on his brothers. Now, just to remind you, they have real bad intentions for their brother, and their father Jacob refuses to acknowledge this. He's just totally just oblivious to the fact there's so much animosity between them and, and Joseph. Here's what happened. But they saw him, Joseph, in the distance. And before he reached them, they what? They plotted to kill him. Question, how did they know it was Joseph before they could see his face? The robe. He the robe. In verse 19, they say, they don't say, here comes our little brother. They say, here comes that little dreamer. And maybe we do that sometimes when someone's hurt us, when you think of them. We don't think of them as a person. We like to, we kind of like devalue them. We classify them. We go, you know what, he's a narrow-minded bigot. Oh, you know what, she's a flaming liberal. We like to kind of classify people, totally dehumanize them. And that's what they're doing right here to, to, to Joseph. And here's the plan their brothers have. Come now, let's kill him, throw him into one of those cisterns, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his stupid dreams. Well, ultimately, they decide not to kill him. They decide actually to sell him off into slavery. And they take the coat and they tear it up. They dip it in goat's blood. They take it to their dad, Jacob, and they say, oh, no, dad, look what happened to your precious son. He's been killed by a ferocious animal. And the Bible says that he grieves so greatly that he refused, it said, he refused to be comforted. So Joseph is forcibly taken off to Egypt. He's sold as a, 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 to a man in, in Pharaoh's court named Potiphar. Potiphar was the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. We'll talk about that in a second. He faced a horrific, 
abuse and betrayal. The strangest things happen though. There's an incredible statement and I've seen those of us who've already read the Bible and in the, in the, you actually, some of you mark this and you put it on social media. I saw this. It says this incredible statement right there when he is at the bottom of the bottom. Here's what it says. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. It appears that the most bizarre time Joseph had gone from being an exalted one to the enslaved one, from being the, 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 you know, the cream of the crop in the family, now outside the family. He's experiencing the horrors of human trafficking, and yet in some mysterious way, God made sure he made himself known to Joseph that Joseph knew he was not alone. See, Joseph hadn't done a single thing to merit God's blessing. He hadn't done a single thing to merit God's presence. As far as we can tell, I mean, up to this point, he's been very self-absorbed. He's been incredibly insensitive. And now in slavery, God is with Joseph. And so the God of Abraham kind of teaches us one thing. I want to start off with this, and that is this. You will find me, God says, in the last place you'll look for him. You will find God in the last place you would look for God. In the last moment you would expect, God says, I will be there. And Potiphar notices something special about this young man that he acquired. He's got these rare leadership abilities. And all of a sudden, he doesn't take long for Potiphar to put Joseph as in charge of his estate, his kingdom. Look what it says. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with what? With anything. With anything except the food he ate. And Joseph is totally trusted here and gives the keys. Potiphar gives the keys over to his entire state. And just when you think the story is about to turn better for Joseph, all of a sudden it takes a desperate housewife's turn. Potiphar's wife, who would have been certainly a beautiful Egyptian woman... At first, she became infatuated with Joseph, and then she becomes inflamed with Joseph, and Mrs. Potiphar suddenly turns into Mrs. Potiphar. And the Bible says this, now Joseph was well-built and handsome. He was well-built and handsome. Now, you know, some of us are going, what does that look like? And I know all of us are probably thinking the same thing. What that looks like is right here on the screen. It looks like, you know, Pastor Anthony. (laughs) Also known as Big E. I mean, well-built and handsome. We know that Shine is a very blessed woman, right? I mean, he's kind of the trophy husband. So, so, um, so yeah, yeah, he's well-built and handsome. And all of a sudden, here's what the Bible says. She says to him, she basically says to him, come to bed with me. It's kind of the PG version, by the way. The Hebrew actually is much more graphic than that. And then, and then Joseph does one of the most remarkable things that you could do. In that moment, he says this. When she's coming after him, she says, he says this to her. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against who? And sin against God. Not sin against you, Mrs. Potiphar, or against your husband, or against myself. It's sinning against God. He understands that when we sin sexually, what happens is we are offending God. And the Bible says that though she spoke to him day in and day out, he refused to go to bed with her. He refused to even be around her. And there's a saying, if you don't intend to go in the house, stay off the porch, right? And that's exactly what Joseph does. So here's what we see from Joseph. He had these huge dreams, but massive disappointment. So here's the the thing. In the midst of the disappointment, guess what happened? Joseph stayed faithful. In the midst of disappointment, Joseph stayed faithful. And I'm going to tell you something really important. What happens to most of us when disappointment comes, because disappointment always comes in our lives, is we have a way of allowing the disappointments to justify disobedience. We say, well, if God doesn't hold up his end of the deal, like if this is the way my story and my life's going to unfold, because God seemed me let me down over here, I'm going to do what I want over there. But here's the truth, church. Disappointment should not justify disobedience. And oftentimes we allow it. We, 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 we make that happen. We, we justify all kinds of things because we're disappointed. And I think it's especially true when it comes to sexual sin. In the context of Joseph's story, that's what 
is taking place, and we see it in our own culture. If you're single, you thought maybe by now you'd be married. You thought you'd by now you'd find that special someone, and you tried eHarmony. You tried Christian Mingle. You've been on blind dates, you know, set up by your second cousin. Hopefully not with your second cousin, but, you know, you've been, you've tried all kinds of things. You try to follow God's standard, but let's be honest. The longer he takes, the more tempting it is to lower your standard. And I just have to say, you know, I've talked to several singles in our RCC family, and I am so thankful many of you are holding your standards high. Because I would say this, whatever you expect, that's what you get. Whatever you expect, that's what you get. And so you're holding your standards, but sometimes people over time, they just kind of disappointment. They lower their standards down, and the more disappointed you are, the easier it is to justify disobedience. Uh, there was two brothers, they were talking, uh, a, a married brother in Christ and a single brother in Christ. They were talking about a survey that took place about, it asked Christians, what is the number one sin you struggle with? 90% of them said lust. The, the single brother said, I know what the other 10% struggle with. And the married brother said, what, what's that? He said, lying. <laughs> it's not just true of those who are single, but also true of those who are married. The only thing worse than being disappointed in single is being disappointed in married. Like the guy who got married, he says, hey, when I got married, I had an ideal. I got into an ordeal. Now I want a new deal. So what happens in marriage? Here's what happens. The wife can't remember the last time she felt loved by her husband. So then she starts justifying having a fling and having inappropriate relationships with somebody online or somebody in the office. Or, or maybe it's a man who all of a sudden is so, is so tired of hearing his wife speak about being intimate with him like it's a chore. And so he starts going to secret websites. You see, in moments of disappointment, we have a tendency to justify disobedience. And Joseph could have easily justified this, but he doesn't. He is faithful to God in the midst of disappointment. But one day, Potiphar, wife, Potiphar's wife kicks up her aggression quite, up, quite a big notch here. She just says to him very bluntly, come to bed with me. She grabs him by the coat. And then he slips out of it and he runs off. And there she is by herself holding his coat. And then she screams, abuse. And immediately a security comes walking in and there they see Mrs. Potiphar holding on to his coat. It seems to be an open and shut case. I mean, just just easy. Obviously, we know what happened here. But what's interesting to me is Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard, another translation, he's an executioner. Like he kills people for a living. He's got all kinds of creative ways to end someone's life. And I think the text seems to say that Potiphar trusted Joseph more than he trusted his wife. But he's got to do something. So what does he do? The text says this, Joseph's master Potiphar took him and put him in prison. The place where the the king's prisoners were confined. And when it says prison, it really means pit. He is put in a pit. He's done nothing. Think about this. He has done nothing to deserve this. It wasn't his sin. It wasn't his disobedience. It wasn't his rebellion. It wasn't his unfaithfulness. The victim of somebody else's disobedient, sinful choices. First, he's a slave. And you're thinking, what's worse than being a slave? How about a slave and a prisoner? And I think it's interesting. As we look at his life, sometimes we ask this, this question, where's God? Where is God in the midst of disappointment? 13 years go by before his story turns for the better. 13 years. And some of you, some of you in the room and you online are in a very difficult, long chapter right now. And the question you're asking is this one. Where is God? My best friend in, in, in college and his, and his sister, we would all hang out quite a bit. And his sister you know, just lost one of her kids. She was 16 years old. Her, his sister lost her 16-year-old daughter to, because of seizures. Um, where's God in the midst of that this past week? Where's God in the midst of uh, 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 a guy named John who's on his third round of chemo and he just lost his wife this past year to cancer? Where's God in the midst of that disappointment? Well, where's God with Jackie whose husband left her 
while she's pregnant with her first child for someone else. He just left her. Where's God in the midst of that disappointment? Where is God when you are in the pit? Well, strangely enough, the Bible says exactly the same thing when Joseph was a slave. Look what it says about about Joseph while he's in prison. The Lord was, look at this, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison guard. So here's the second thing God teaches us, and here it is. Joseph learns there is no place God cannot go. No moment God cannot be. Sometime the greatest, in the place of the greatest fear, sometime the place of the greatest hurt, sometime the place of the greatest pain comes the greatest place of God's presence. And I wonder, are you in a hard place this morning? I wonder, are you in a pit somewhere? Maybe it's physical, maybe it's financial, maybe it's relational, maybe it's a spiritual pit and he is causing you right now to despair. I wonder if that's you. And, I, and it would have been so easy. I know you're tempted to this, but it's so easy for Joseph to give up. But he discovers this. In the last place you would look for God, there he is. There's God. And this is very important, so hear me out. God may not move you to a new place, but he can put a new you in your old place. God may not move you to a new place, but he can put a new you in your old place. Amen, church? I talked to a brother this past week. He got burned down on ministry, had to leave it because of all the stress. And what ended up happening is he ended up getting help. And now he helps those who are in ministry so they don't get burned out. And he says, you know what, Nathan? I'm in the same place I was, like physically in the same place. And all that came crashing down on me. But I want to tell you, I'm a new you. <laughs> And I love hearing that. And that can make the old place be like a new place. And what happens is out of God's presence comes God's blessings. Well, the prison warden sees the same thing that Potiphar saw in Joseph. And the prison warden warden puts Joseph in charge of the whole prison. He's got two prisoners underneath him. One's a cupbearer for the Pharaoh and the other's a baker for the palace. And both of these men had dreams, crazy dreams, and it disturbed them. And here's what Scripture says. We both had what? Dreams. Isn't it interesting? This this idea of dreams goes all the way through the Joseph story. We had dreams, but there is no one to interpret them. Well, each one of them tell their dream to Joseph, and then he interprets each one of them one by one. First, he says to the cupbearer, he says, hey, within three days, interpretation of your dream is this. Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore, key word, restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. And the cupbearer says, man, that's awesome. Joseph, when I get out of here, I'm going to remember you. The baker overhears this. He likes that interpretation. He's like, my, t- my turn. He goes up to Joseph. He tells him his dream. And then here's the interpretation of, of, of the baker's dream. He says, Joseph says, within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale. What? Impale your body on a pole and the birds will eat away your flesh. And the baker says, that's the last time I tell you one of my dreams. Three days later, Exactly what Joseph said would happen, happened. One is exalted, the other is executed. And then we read these words that had to add insult to pour salt on all of Joseph's wounds. Here's what it says. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He what church? He forgot him. Now we all forget on occasion. Raise your hand if you forgot something this past week, like somebody's name your pants, I mean, whatever it was, raise your hand if you forgot something. Like, where am I at and why am I here, you know? We all forget on occasion. A good buddy of mine forgot his anniversary. Best thing in the world happened to him, his wife also forgot the anniversary. Like, (laughs) there's a God. That never happens. Forget is kind of human, right? It's just human. But sometimes it's plain selfish. But sometimes we forget When it's not convenient and it's not an advantage for us to remember. The chief cupbearer didn't want even a hint of his imprisonment to enter the Pharaoh's mind so he didn't bring up Joseph. Two years pass by and Pharaoh has a dream and no one can interpret it. Pharaoh is so disturbed that he's about to lop off some royal heads from his royal staff. And suddenly the cupbearer has an epiphany. 
and remembers Joseph. How convenient. Hmm. And then chapter 41, it says this. He says, uh, hey, to the Pharaoh, he says, hey, there's a guy I met back in prison a few years ago. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Jack, Jerry, Jerome. Oh, yeah, that's right. Joseph. Joseph. And he's pretty good with this whole you know, dream stuff. Immediately, here's what happens. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was, look at this, quickly brought from the dungeon. To get this image, think about this. The most powerful man in the world is now telling his dream to a former slave, to a foreign prisoner. And God gives Joseph's interpretation. Pharaoh believes him. And then he turns to his cabinet and says this. Look at the scripture. It says, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom he is, he is the spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning, there is no one as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Translated, you are the most, you're the second most powerful man on the planet like right now. With one sweeping decree, Joseph goes from the pit to the palace. And Pharaoh is saying, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. It's like, what in the world is happening? And I just have to tell you, you got to note this. I love this about God. He does this all the time. One of the first things we see about Pharaoh he does for Joseph is this. He dressed Joseph in robes of fine linen. Up to this point, Joseph has had two coats. He had one coat that was ripped off of him because of disgust. His brothers couldn't stand his guts. Another one was lifted off in lust because Mrs. Potiphar wanted him. And then now he is given one by God and it has a divine trust. It's like, how could all this happen? It's because God is working out all things for his good, church. See, right now is a, is a time that God wants to rescue his people from the famine. And he needs someone in power. He needs someone in authority. Who does he choose? A former ex-con, a, a, ex, a former slave named Joseph. See, when God writes his story, he always chooses the most unlikely cast of characters, doesn't he? And maybe right now you're like, there's no way God can use me. I'm too broken, I'm too negative, I'm too disappointed. There's no way God can use me. I'm so down and out. I'm telling you right now, you're in perfect situation for God to use you. So God uses Joseph to execute the plan to save lives of millions and millions of people. Seven days of prosperity are followed by seven days of famine. The famine doesn't just impact Egypt. It impacts the regions around Egypt. It impacts Canaan. Guess whose family lives in Canaan? Joseph's family. Jacob is back in Canaan, and they've got, all the, they've got tons of money, but they don't have any food they can buy. And so Jacob sends out Joseph's older brothers, the one who sold him into slavery. And they go to Egypt because Egypt has stockpiles of food. Now, I want you to think about this. It has been 22 years since the last time Joseph and his brothers last saw each other. The last time they saw each other was when his brothers kidnapped him and sold him into slavery. They have no idea that this powerful, exalted man that they're about to meet is their little brother. They have no idea. And when they come before Joseph, look what happened. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they did what, church? They bowed down to him with their faces. Remember the dreams? They bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And Joseph immediately recognizes them because you do not forget the faces of abuse. He doesn't tell them who he is. First, he starts accusing them of being spies. And they're like, no, 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 no. Your servants were just 12 brothers and the sons of one man who lives out in the land of Canaan. And, and the youngest is now with our father and one is no more. And Joseph keeps probing, he keeps prodding, he keeps testing, and it gets to a point where it just has this huge release, this huge climax, and then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. 
and he wept so loudly. Think of all that pent up energy and motion over the last two decades. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I and Joseph, is my father still living? But his brothers wet their pants. I mean, it's basically what happened. I mean, they just... They were not able to answer him because they were so terrified of his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, he said, come, come close, come close. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold in Egypt. This was the best kept secret in Canaan. And he said, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was a save lives that God sent me ahead of you. He's saying, do not be angry yourselves because what God has done is he is using our family to save people's lives. And at the end of Joseph's story, he makes an amazing statement towards the end of his life. And he says this to his brothers. He says, you intend to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done. What's that? The saving it's about the saving of many lives. The brothers don't know that when they sold him off to slavery. Joseph doesn't know that when he is, you know, kidnapped and then a prisoner later on. But here's what God does all the time. He takes all those horrible decisions you made and other people made that impacted you. All those broken pieces. All those devastating disappointments. And he says this, I can work with that. I can work with that. And God takes all those ragged, messed up pieces, broken world experiences, and he accomplishes his purposes. Amen, church? He accomplishes his purposes. Nothing can, nothing can sidetrack that. And Joseph basically says to his brother, God can redeem your disgrace. God has redeemed your disgrace. And here's what I want, I want to say to you today. Never, never give up on God redeeming your story. Never give up on God redeeming your story. It's one of my favorite things about God. He can redeem anything. It's never too broken it's never too busted. It's never too late. He can take all those broken experiences and he can make something beautiful. And we find as we read through the Bible, all those broken spirit, those pieces that we're going to read as we continue our journey through the Bible, all those broken pieces are leading to a great redeemer and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen, church? And Joseph spent a lifetime and a long time wrestling with this, a long time as a slave, a long time in prison, but God had not left him. The Lord was still with him. Looking back, Joseph sees it. And he would echo the words of Paul who wrote these words years later. I want you to stand with me right now. Will you stand with me right now? We're going to read these words. You guys online, you guys read them with us. And we're going to read them as lines, all right? Let's read these words from Paul with confidence. So here we go on the count of three. One, two, three. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, that means in exciting, great things and devastating, disappointing things. And our tendency, when disappointment comes, is to become with bitter, to become withdrawn, to become hard. But in the midst of disappointment, God is still there. And when we are loved by God, we know that he works out all things for our good. So the question this morning for you here in the room and online is this. How will you respond when you have a dream for your life, but it brings out a whole bunch of disappointments? How are you going to respond? We all start out thinking that, you know, our story is going to be written a certain way. And all of a sudden, it doesn't work out quite as planned. Family, we don't know the challenges we're going to face. We don't know the hurts we have to handle that's coming up next. We don't know the suffering that's going to come our way. But we do know this. We know that in all things, God 
works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. Amen, church? We know he works out all things for the good. Not all things are good, but he works out all things for the good. And we know that we're not alone in this journey. The Lord was with Joseph, and I just want you to hear me this morning. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And maybe the word you came walking in here today was disappointment. You're disappointed. But I want you to hear me. The Lord, He's the one that has the last word. So, in a moment, I'm going to encourage you, if you have a disappointment, you can actually fill out that response card there. If you have a disappointment you want to take to the cross, now's the time to do that. As we sing a song about the goodness of God, we sing a song about the character of God, I want us to take all those disappointments to the cross. And you can write on a disappointment you have right now. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe right now you're struggling with sin. And you're disappointed that you can't kick it yet. (laughs) Those online, you can actually go to riverchristian.church slash connect and fill out your disappointments there. And take it to the cross that way. But right now, I want you to physically take one of those cards and take it to the cross as we sing in a moment. Maybe today you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. Let us know about the response card. Take it to the cross and we'll follow up with you. And let's go to the God who can redeem all disappointments through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray right now. Father God, we come before you. And Lord, you know, you know our dreams. And Lord, we know that you are the great author. And you are the great redeemer. So, Lord, right now we hand the steering wheel of our life over to you. And we put it in your hands. We give you our disappointments. We give you our discouragements, our stresses. Maybe what someone has done to us or maybe what we've even done to ourselves. Sometimes, Lord, we look in the mirror. We're not even happy with who we are. And, Lord, as we study the life of Joseph, I know that everyone can relate to some degree what life is like when we face disappointment And it doesn't turn out the way we had hoped. And Father, will you help us to put our faith in your goodness? In this life or the next, everything through the power of Jesus Christ will be redeemed. And we praise you for that. But right now, God, we want to hand over you our disappointments. And Lord, we thank you so much for taking these off of our shoulders. And Lord, may we Walk in confidence knowing you can handle this and you can redeem anything. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and the whole church said, amen. So right now as we sing about the goodness of God, why don't you take your disappointments to the cross. You guys online can go to riverchristian.church slash connect, fill out that card. But right now, let's take our disappointments to the cross and allow him to take it from us.